uh, with us, uh, Pharmacogenomics. And, and so uh, uh, I'll be introducing her here a little bit further to, uh, to introduce the case. Um, but um, uh, getting into the meat of some of the didactic content, and we're going to focus today on a, on a case that uh, revolves around this as well, um, but we're talking about the pharmacogenomics of SSRIs. Um, we could talk about antidepressants more generally, but the, the, the amount of time that we have is limited, and there's no way that we'd be able to get through this. Um, many of us are probably familiar with, with this content. It's, it's uh, kind of in the canon of, of uh, CPIC and, and, the, and the Dutch guidelines. And so uh, without any further ado, um, some of it will be review, but uh, we'll, we'll just jump right in. Um, Disclosure-wise, I have no financial or professional disclosures to report. So we'll begin very, very broadly and briefly with, uh, with depression and anxiety medications. I alluded to the fact that there are many, many options for depression, and it would take us much, much more time than we have to be able to address all the different options. But on the left of your screen, you see the first line, first line medications, which is our topic at hand today, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs. They are first line for depression and anxiety. And oftentimes when we see these patients in, uh, uh, in our pharmacogenomics practice, this is going to be um, going to be where the majority of our interventions end up being, and because CPIC focuses on these first line therapies for the current guidelines, obviously this is uh, well where a number of our recommendations end up coming in. Um, obviously, the second line options on the right right hand side of the screen, a wide wide swath of different medications, different uh, mechanisms mechanisms of action, and so um, I won't spend any time or any more time. Um, seems like it would be a good topic for another uh, another ECHO meeting. I'm sure we will we'll be addressing those at some point in the future. Well, so when we talk about pharmacogenomics, uh, I, I ask the question here, I, I load the question, um, what does the evidence currently tell us about pharmacogenomics and depression? And, and I have way more content here than I could possibly even, even cover. Um, I put it in here anyway, hoping optimistically that we get through it, but... Um, I'll, I'll do my best to, to at least uh, address bits and pieces of it as we go. And uh, if we don't get to it, well, that's fine. We'll, we'll uh, leave it for another time. Um, but depression, generally speaking, what, what do we know? Well, we know that 30 to 50% of individuals will not respond adequately to antidepressants. I mean, that's just antidepressants in general. That's not even the pharmacogenomics. We just know that a large swath of individuals will not respond adequately. Within pharmacogenomics, or pharmacogenetics, we start talking about two genes, in particular CYP2C19 and CYP2D6, are responsible for the metabolism, and I'll underscore metabolism, of most antidepressants. We know that there are many other genes that are responsible for, uh, for, for metabolism of these drugs, um, but these are the main two ones. Um, and beyond that, there are many pharmacodynamic genes that, that uh, also impact how um, how antidepressants work, and so um, so it's it's not just um, it's not just metabolism that's important, but this is where the body of the data really rests is in metabolism, focused on CYP2C19 and CYP2D6. Within the Midwest, and the majority of us uh, within within our echo cohort cohort within the Midwest, approximately ten to thirty five percent have a genetic variant that can either um, increase antidepressant levels that leads to side effects or decrease antidepressant drug, drug levels. And that ultimately limits uh, effectiveness, at least theoretically. Um, and then just finally, when I start talking through this data, it's important to realize that most of these SSRIs have a dozen or more studies that are evaluate the genetic effect on either drug levels or the clinical outcomes. And most of it focuses on the drug levels, the pharmacokinetic information, though uh, we're seeing more and more clinical outcome studies. So SSRI metabolism is complex uh, to be to be to be certain um, and the there, there's a number of different factors that go into the, the metabolism we know that there are many different enzymes I, you know I, I alluded on the last slide that cyp 2 c19 and cyp 2d6 are the main drivers but we know that there are other enzymes that that really act on psychoactive agents including SSRIs uh, cyp 182 cyp 384 385 um, there are others but uh, we, we know that there are many, many different, uh, different enzymes in this process, um, but not all those enzymes have, have variants that affect function. So 3A4, we know that there are tons of drug interactions. 
Um, but it doesn't have a, a profound uh, genetic variation that, that really will, will ultimately um, il eliminate its function or, or uh, increase uh, metabolism in a profound way. Yeah. So there, are, there is a tremendous amount of, of variability between the drugs and even amongst the enzymes that we talk about. But in SSRIs in particular, we can generally divide these into two classes by its primary metabolizing enzymes. So CYP2D6 affects fluoxetine, fluvoxamine, peroxine, 2C19, citalopram, escitalopram, and sertraline. And so you see that graphically on this figure. Um, at the top in the blue is citalopram, escitalopram, and sertraline, metabolized into inactive metabolized by 2C19. And fluvoxamine and peroxetine by 2D6, um, or CYP2D6, into likewise its inactive metabolites. Uh, flu fluoxetine has kind of a different role because it is metabolized by CYP2D6. It does metabolize into norfluoxetine. Um, those familiar with the kinetics of fluoxetine know that, uh, that both, of those, uh, both of those agents are active and have a tremendously long half-lives. So 2D6 or CYP2D6 maybe doesn't have as profound an effect on, on fluoxetine as it does the other ones, uh, but I added it here for, uh, for just for comparison and for full understanding. And so when we talk about the variation and metabolism of these drugs, uh, pictorially, I took citalopram here, I gave it an example. And uh, so CYP2C19 is main driver, uh, or driver, main driver of metabolism, uh, metabolized into desmethyl citalopram, which is inactive as denoted by the gray box. Um, of course, we know that CYP2C19 has decreased metabolism or has varied, uh, varied alleles that have decreased metabolism. So the star 2 star 3 alleles do have decreased metabolism and can ultimately uh, make it so that you can have either decreased or complete absent function. And when that happens, you have an increase in the, uh, the active drug and a decrease in the metabolite. And conversely, if you have increased metabolism for 2C19, the star 17 allele is known to increase the transcription of 2C19, so you just have more enzyme on board. And that, it, as compared to normal metabolizers, decreases the amount of citalopram um, th that's available or that's in the bloodstream in, in the serum um, and increases the amount of uh, inactive metabolites, so, so it drives the reaction faster. So obviously, uh, the variation in these enzymes can have a profound effect on, on the, uh, the metabolism uh, of the drugs. And so CPIC weighed in on this a number of years back. Uh, the current guidelines, I do not have, or you can't see the citation at the, or at least I can't see the citation at the bottom, um, uh, but uh, go to cpicpgx.org and look for the uh, CPIC recommendation for SSRIs. And when they, when they proposed this data, uh, basically they, they summarized it exactly uh, as, as I described previously. Um, rapid and ultra rapid metabolizer for 2C19 uh, affects citalopram, escitalopram, and sertraline. Those all start with the S sound, so they're easy to remember. Um, and so you may have uh, basically the recommendations are to consider an alternate uh, alternate medication. Um, sertraline, because the data wasn't as strong, consider an alternate if the patient doesn't respond to treatment. Um, and so I'll, I'll just uh, just pause at that there for now. Um, the poor metabolizers at the bottom of the spectrum uh, consider a 50% reduction or select alternative drug not metabolized by 2C19. For 2D6 and paroxetine and fluvoxamine, the results or the, uh, the recommendations are essentially the same for those drugs respectively. Ultra rapids uh, pick a different drug uh, because of, uh, because of uh, the, the risk for uh, loss of efficacy. Poor metabolizers consider a dose reduction or select something else because of uh, the, the drug ultimately uh, will lead to higher levels and, and potential toxicity. Being mindful of the time, um, I, I, I do wanna point this out or, or uh, spend just a few moments with, uh, with, a couple, with a couple studies, at least using this as a, a highlight for, uh, for ultimately why we understand this to be the case or these, these, uh, these um, effects to be the case. So um, Dave Kaiser uh, a couple of weeks ago basically showed a, a very, very similar, um, very similar type of figure as on the left. And it just shows the relative metabolizer, um, ultra rapid or UM rapid or RM, normal metabolizer in the middle, um, uh, intermediate metabolizer IM, and then poor metabolizer ranging from uh, 
highest rate of metabolism to lowest rate of metabolism. And when you when you um, when they do these studies, they, they look at these individuals in these different phenotypes, and uh, we'll look at the drug ratios or the drug levels and and compare them amongst these different phenotypes. And so this one study uh, from Pharmacogenomics Journal uh, in 2011 looked at citalopram levels, and they found that the ratio of citalopram to uh, desmethyl citalopram or active to inactive um, was was lower in the ultra rapid metabolizers, higher in the poor metabolizers and form more or less this linear relationship. And so drug levels, uh, you have lower drug levels in ultra metabolizers, higher active drug levels in poor metabolizers. So um, we see this time and time again, study after study in the SSRIs and other studies as well. And I'll, I'll transfer that or push you over to the right side of the figure where we start talking about clinical outcomes, because it's great if we have difference in drug levels, but what does that mean in terms of clinical outcomes? So um, they did a genetic substudy of the STAR-D trial, um, and the date was, it was uh, likewise published in 2011. Um, and when, when they looked at this, they were looking at specifically just the clinical outcomes, and uh, specifically the med medication tolerance or remission rates. And I won't walk you through all the, the fine details uh, of, of that table, but grouping the ultra-rapid and the rapid metabolizers, or those that have gain of function, and the intermediates and the poor metabolizers or loss of function, um, you can see that medication tolerance generally increased when you have gain of function at a loss of remission. Um, and the opposite is essentially uh, the case. It, it flips when you talk about those that have a decreased function, you have decreased medication tolerance um, due to side effects, uh, but of course the remission rate actually improves. Um, uh, so higher concentrations, more side effects, but the remission gets better. So um, the clinical outcomes are correlative, at, at, to say the least, uh, with, with the drug levels. Um, and that's, of course, inference between two different studies, so I don't want to infer that anything more than that, but, but do be mindful of the, that there are clinical outcomes that are starting to show. Um, I don't have time to, to walk through the guided study as much as I would like. I will focus on one slide here. Um, and, and But uh, the guided study was a randomized uh, study, 24 weeks in depression. They looked at uh, primary outcome assessment um, of, of decrease in depression scores at eight weeks. And, and so it was a relatively large randomized trial, 1,100 participants. Uh, everybody got PGX trial, uh, testing, and then they split them into two groups, treatment as usual and pharmacogenomics guided, and looked for symptom improvement in these, in these individuals. I'm going to skip over this. Uh, I will point out that the primary outcome was not statistically significant, and that was symptom improvement at eight weeks, um, which seems important uh, until you consider that when you look at congruent medications, so medications that were taking the patients, participants that were taking the right medication based on the pharmacogenomics results, um, the primary outcome was then significant. It was uh, a difference of about uh, 10, 12 points difference in, uh, in uh, uh, symptom improvement. And if you look at the individuals receiving, uh, receiving remission, it was three times better in those that were uh, receiving a medication that was PGX congruent. So what we're starting to see from the pharmacogenomics of the data is, is that the, uh, the results when we get patients on the right medication uh, per their PGX. And this was uh, more than just 2C19 and CYP2D6. It was a range, it was a panel. Um, but consider that if we get patients on the correct medications per their, per their pharmacogenomics, um, we do actually see, um, see quite a bit better outcomes. And so we're waiting on the results from a couple randomized pharmacogenomics studies that are in progress or just, just at the front. Prime Care is in the VA. Uh, the DOT PGX trial is uh, NIH funded. And so these two trials, if you're interested, there's, there's good, uh, good information on clinicaltrials.gov, but they're open and rolling. Uh, results should be out later this year, early next year, uh, maybe as late as uh, 2023. And um, so hopefully we'll have much better information in depression for SSRIs, um, other antidepressants in a randomized pharmacogenomics study.